On today's episode, we're out here taking a look at the 2016 Jeep Renegade. This is Jeep's smallest crossover in America, and this does business with the likes of the Honda HRV, the Mazda CX-3, the Nissan Juke, etc. Up front, we definitely have a very Jeep look. This looks like a very upright front end, although the front bumper actually sticks out a little bit further than the grille itself. We have this traditional seven slot grille, very large round headlamps. They actually put the side marker lamps right over here on the front fender itself, fog lamps right down below. You'll notice that the front end changes a little bit from trim to trim. We're taking a look at the top end limited trim, but there are actually two top end trims for the Renegade like we see in the Cherokee. There's also the Trailhawk, and in my mind, I would call them both the top end trims, although they're after quite different missions. The other thing you'll notice up front is how wide the Renegade is. This is about four inches wider than something like a Honda HRV, and it really shows, especially right here at the front fender flares, in order to accommodate a slightly wider track. Although this is wider than the Honda, it's definitely shorter. This is 166.6 inches long, which means this is one of the shorter subcompact crossovers in America. We have this very upright rear end, which does improve practicality in the cargo area, but because this is shorter, we don't have quite as much room as we see in some of the competition. As you'd expect from a vehicle with off-roading in mind, ground clearance comes in tops in this segment. We have 6.7 inches of ground clearance in the front wheel drive trims. If you get the all wheel drive trim like we're seeing right here, it goes up to 7.9. Then if you get the Trailhawk version, you get 8.1. 8.1 inches of ground clearance is actually very similar to what we see in the Jeep Grand Cherokee, not most subcompact crossovers like a Mazda CX-3, Honda HRV, etc. The rear end of the Renegade is very vertical, and that's not just the hatch, it's also the bumper. It only sticks out about an inch beyond this rear hatchback. Jeep puts this little headlamp and slotted grille logo all over the Renegade. There are tons inside, outside the Jeep. They're also on the headlamps, on the speaker grills, and even a large one on the Renegade's tailgate. Jeep Renegades headed for the U.S. market have two different engines under the hood. Things start out with a 1.4 liter four-cylinder turbocharged engine that produces 160 horsepower and 184 pound-feet of torque. The interesting thing is that that engine is mated only to a manual transmission. Then we have this 2.4 liter four-cylinder non-turbocharged engine that produces 180 horsepower and 175 pound-feet of torque, and this is mated only to a nine-speed automatic transmission. You can't get the manual with this particular engine. For those of you paying attention, this is basically the same engine and transmission that's used in the larger Jeep Cherokee brought down here to the Jeep Renegade. Fuel economy comes in at 24 miles per gallon in the version that we are driving, which is the limited trim with the 2.4 liter engine and the all wheel drive system. You'll notice on that chart over there on the side of your screen that fuel economy is a little bit below some of the competition, but that's largely because of the off-road mission that the Renegade has in mind. This ends up being a decent amount heavier than some of the other vehicles in this segment, basically because of the all wheel drive mission. Creating an off-road capable Jeep isn't just about four-wheel drive or all-wheel drive systems, although the Renegade definitely has a very capable one. This is one of the few all-wheel drive systems in any crossover, in any size segment, that has a lockable center coupling that you can manually control. In addition to the lockable center coupling, we also have an available two-speed transfer case, which gives the Renegade a low ratio crawl mode that you just don't find in any other crossovers out there. Front seat comfort comes in at 10 out of 10 points in our limited model. We do have the four-way adjustable lumbar support and the power driver's seat. It's very rare to find any adjustable lumbar support in this segment, let alone a four-way adjustable variety. That coupled with a large range of motion for the driver's seat and a tilt telescopic steering column with a suitably large range of motion means it's very easy for short or tall drivers to find an ideal driving position in this vehicle. Rear seat comfort comes in at nine out of 10 points. Although we get a little bit less legroom than we find in something like the HRV, it is significantly more than you find in the Mazda CX-3. Also significantly more is the headroom. I have about three inches of headroom and our model does have the optional dual sunroof. That carries over here to the middle seat where I have more headroom than you'll find in the HRV or the CX-3 or basically any other entry in the segment. Moving all the way over to the right side of the vehicle, this front seat is all the way back in its tracks and you can see that my knees are touching the seat back, but again, I still have a decent amount of headroom. In addition to the headroom, the Renegade is also wider than the other entries in this segment. This is again about four inches wider than the Honda HRV and that plays right into the width of this rear bench seat. It's a lot easier to fit three adults across the back than in that Honda. Behind the hatch, we have 18.5 cubic feet of storage space from the rear seat back right here to the back of the cargo area. That is a little bit less than we see in the Honda HRV, but this is significantly more than we see in something like a Mazda CX-3. That means we can very easily put 26 or 24 inch roller bags in the back. They'll actually even fit on their sides right here below this tonneau cover. We also have a very sturdy load floor that you can actually adjust in terms of height or completely remove from the vehicle. 
Once that's removed from the vehicle, if we lift up the final divider, you'll notice that we don't have a spare tire. We just have an inflator, can affix a flat, and then some additional storage right here. Now you will find a spare tire in certain models. You could definitely fit it in there. We just don't have one in the limited trim. As I said, we have the optional dual sunroof in our model. So we have one panel right there and then one panel above the rear seats. Now these are not glass panels. These are actually sort of a polycarbonate panel. Although both the front and the rear panels are removable from the vehicle, only the front panel is powered. And the front panel has a vent mode, which you can barely see right there is cracked open. Or we can close it and then completely open the panel like this, just like you would see in a traditional moonroof. To remove the panels from the vehicle, first I need this bag to put the panels in, and then I need this little Jeep key that actually unlocks the panel from the roof. So I'm going to go ahead and unzip this so we can put the panels in. There we go. And then we just hop inside, stick the key in the right slot, unlatch it right like that, and then you can either try and remove it from inside the vehicle, or you can just come outside, pull it off right like that. And then we have one panel off the vehicle. Just drop it in this bag. Then we hop into the back seat and repeat the process. And the uh, back panel is a reverse of the front panel. So it opens right like that and then slides to the front. And there's the back panel off the, uh, off the Jeep. Pop this also in the bag. Both panels are now in the bag, so we just zip it up and put it in the trunk. Thankfully, the cargo area was designed for this in mind, so we just slide that right into place, and the cargo load floor will actually go right on top of that, perfectly flat. And we can put our luggage right on top of that. Obviously, if we had a large glass panoramic roof, we wouldn't be able to open the rear section like we see here. We would just get the ability to see out. We wouldn't get the ability to have air in our hair. But the other reason, of course, is because of this center cross member right here. It adds structural rigidity to the vehicle. And it means this is more off-road capable than it would be if it did have a large glass roof. Both the driver and the front passenger have height adjustable seat belts, and our model does have the optional leather upholstery. This interior is full of little Easter eggs or little design touches, just like this little Jeep logo right here where we have the slotted grille and the two headlamps. You'll find that all over the interior. Making the interior perhaps a little bit more youthful, we have this tri-tone seat design. So we have brown on the back of the seat that matches the rest of the interior trim with a sort of Nike orange, and then we have the off-white leather on the front. The front doors are primarily composed of hard touch plastics. So this upper portion of brown, the center section of tan right there, and the lower brown section right around that storage cubby and the speaker grill, that's all a hard touch plastic. The armrest and the plastic above the armrest is a soft touch plastic. And then we have orange trim around this lower speaker grill and a little Jeep logo again that mirrors what we saw on the seat. The upper portion of the dashboard is a soft touch injection molded plastic. The lower portion of the dash is a hard touch plastic. So this entire brown portion is a soft touch material. We have this large grab handle right over here for your passengers so they can hang on if you're off-roading or if you're just driving like a crazy person. We have open and closed controls for all the vents, including these top mounted vents in the center of the dashboard. They're on the top right here. The other ones are on the side. Yet again, more orange trim on that side. Below that grab handle, you'll find a moderately sized glove compartment. I was barely able to fit a full-size iPad in there. You couldn't fit anything like an iPad Pro inside, however. Below the two air vents, we find the infotainment and navigation system. This is basically the same software that we see in the other Chrysler and Jeep products. However, it's running on a smaller screen. Because this is running on a smaller screen, we have some physical buttons that in the 8-inch system are actually provided in the software. So direct access buttons to radio, media, phone, etc. If you want to know more about this infotainment and navigation system, go ahead and click that link at the bottom of your screen. You'll be taken on over to our dedicated infotainment review. Below that is where you'll find the buttons for the heated steering wheel, heated seats, parking sensor disable, lane keep assist enable disable if equipped, and of course the hazard light button. Continuing on below that, we have our dual zone climate control in our particular model. This is a fully automatic climate control system. It's very similar to what we see in some of the other European entries from FCA. Below the dual zone climate control system, we have a knob that we just don't see in other crossovers, let alone subcompact crossovers out there. We have a train selection knob, so you can actually choose between various trains, auto, snow, sand, mud, etc. And we have a four wheel drive lock option. To the right of that, we have one USB input, the auxiliary input, and a 12 volt power outlet, but you'll find an additional USB input in the center console. We also have a small storage cubby right here where you can put your key. Behind that, we have a very traditional console shifter. It has a manual mode that's over to the left. We pull back towards the driver for up, and we push away from the driver for gear down. 
Behind the shifter is where we find the electric parking brake and the traction control enable disable button. We have two very large cup holders right here, easily able to accommodate large takeout drinks. They sink nice and deep in those cup holders so they don't fall out. Between the two front seats, we have a softly padded center armrest. It opens to reveal a moderately sized storage cubby with that additional USB port right inside there. The model that we're taking a look at has the optional large color LCD right between the speedometer and tachometer. Note that the check engine light that's on right over here on the tachometer is just because we have the vehicle in the on position. We actually haven't started the engine. That's just that display telling you that. The LCD portion of the instrument cluster is controlled via this four-way joystick and OK button on the left side of the steering wheel. This display is where we find some of the basics like our engine temperature as well as our fuel level, but there are also a wide variety of different gauges offered in this display. We can see our coolant, we can see our tire pressure, you can see the transmission temperature, oil temperature, etc. You'll find an audio readout with track information depending on the source that you're listening to. You also have access to certain vehicle settings, although the majority of the settings are controlled via the Uconnect display in the center console. The interior in the Renegade is an interesting blend between interior parts that we see in other Dodge, Ram, Chrysler, and Jeep products like this very attractive steering wheel, the same steering wheel that's used essentially in the Grand Cherokee. We have those controls I showed you earlier on the left, and then we have the voice command button, phone hangup pickup button on the bottom of that. The right side of the steering wheel is where you find the controls for the cruise control system, and in a vehicle with radar adaptive cruise control, there would be buttons right down there across the bottom. Now, radar adaptive cruise control is not available on the Renegade, but because this shares the steering wheel with the rest of the Chrysler lineup, we still have those button blanks. As we see in the rest of the FCA vehicles, you'll find the controls for mode selection, that would be media, radio, etc., on the back of the steering wheel, along with track up and down on the left side of the steering wheel, and then volume up and down on the right side of the steering wheel. What's interesting about this, however, is that we also have have some Fiat parts. So we have the same steering column that we see in a variety of different Fiat vehicles. It looks a little bit different than we see in the rest of the Chrysler lineup and then turn signal and windshield wiper stocks that are definitely a little bit different than the other Jeeps in the United States. The difference carries over onto the window switches, which you'll notice are a little bit different than we see in other Chrysler vehicles. This is neither a good thing nor a bad thing. It just makes this a little bit different than some of the other Jeeps on the lot. We're now out here on a private mild off-road trail. This is a mixture of dirt, gravel, sand, and a lot of leaf matter. Of course, this area doesn't get regular maintenance either. This is probably the most difficult terrain that any small crossover would see, but it's also well below the capabilities of the Renegade. That said, however, road surfaces like this really demonstrate the capability of the Renegade's all-wheel drive system. For instance, if we stop this vehicle, we're in four-wheel drive lock. We also have the system in the sand mode. If I hit the accelerator pedal, all four wheels start grabbing. That's not something you see in any of the other small compact crossovers out there. They definitely have an awful lot of slip on the front wheels, and then the power goes to the rear because they don't have the ability to actually lock that center coupling. Even something like a Subaru Crosstrek will still have a little bit of that because even though they're sending some of the power to the rear all the time, it's not a lock all the time. You actually have to get slip before that coupling will try and engage fully. That means that when you start climbing hills aggressively in the Renegade, this just has a grip level that you don't see in the rest of the competition. When it comes to acceleration, we ran from zero to 60 in eight and a half seconds. Even though this vehicle does have one of the more powerful engines in this segment, and we have a nine speed automatic transmission. The reason for that is likely the curb weight. Depending on how you've configured your Renegade, you can get the curb weight up to nearly 3,500 pounds, which is about V6 midsize sedan kind of curb weight. When it comes to braking, our limited trim ran from 60 to zero in 118 feet. However, if you don't get the limited trim and you get some of the other trims that can expand to 120 to 120, 25 feet in the Trailhawk trim. That's all down to the curb weight and the tire size. The limited trim has very wide tires at 225 width. These are some of the largest and widest tires that we see in any of the subcompact entries. The wide tires also help improve the handling score versus the other Renegade models. I'm going to give this a B minus. We definitely get more body roll and more tip and dive and less overall grip than the competition but the vehicle is fairly well composed in the process. This doesn't handle quite as well as the related Fiat 500X, definitely not as well as the Juke or the CX-3, which are the top handling entries in this segment. However, the Renegade in limited trim will still outhandle a decent number of compact crossovers, which are one category above this in overall size. The off-road mission of the Renegade also helps when it comes to the ride because we get softer springs, more suspension travel than we see in the rest of the competition. That leads to a very comfortable highway ride and a very comfortable ride out on bumpy gravel roads like we're on right here. Although the suspension design in the Renegade is definitely tuned for off-roading, I'm going to give this an A when it comes to the ride. This definitely is more supple than the sporty entries in this segment, like the Juke or the CX-3. We feel fewer road imperfections, although we do get our head bobbling around a little bit more than some of those other competitors. That's likely because of the ride height and just the design of the suspension for off-road ability. 
When it comes to cabin noise, we scored 72 decibels, which puts this in the middle of the pack as far as the mainstream competition goes. You will definitely find quieter entries in the next step up, which would be something like the Buick Encore or perhaps some of the Mini models, or definitely the BMWs and Audis. This is fairly quiet for this category, although we do get a little bit more engine noise than I would have expected. When it comes to engine noise, I found the base 1.4 liter four cylinder engine to be a little bit quieter in the cabin than this larger 2.4 liter engine. Part of that seems to be due to the nine speed automatic transmission. Obviously fuel economy is important. So this transmission is trying to keep the engine RPMs as low as possible. And sometimes that means we get a little bit of reverberation in the cabin. Speaking of engines and fuel economy, we've been averaging 22 and a half miles per gallon over about 650 miles of very mixed driving. When it comes to fuel economy, I'm going to give this a B. I think the fuel economy is very good for a vehicle like this, but you will definitely get better fuel economy in some of the other entries in the segment, like the Mazda CX-3 or the Honda HR-V with its continuously variable transmission. Speaking of transmissions, there is one thing you should know about the Renegade. This does use a ZF nine speed automatic transmission. This nine speed transmission is essentially the same transmission that we find in the Range Rover Evoque, the Jeep Cherokee, certain Acura and Honda models. And it does have a peculiar shift behavior. I have a separate video on my channel that goes into detail on why this transmission shifts the way that it does. There's nothing wrong with the transmission. It is shifting exactly as designed. This transmission uses a very unique clutch type that decreases size, decreases weight, and improves efficiency. On the downside, it shifts very differently than other transmissions. So gear shifts one to two, two to three, three to four, those feel perfectly normal. Gear shifts four to five, that actually feels just a little bit slower than normal. The difference really is going down. So if we're downshifting and I put this transmission in the manual mode and I command gear four, it feels like we're going into neutral for a while before gear four engages. And then if I shift to gear three and gear two, gear one, et cetera, those feel very like traditional automatic transmission shifts. There's no neutral feeling going on. That's just down to the design of this particular transmission. And I suspect that most people will adjust to it after time. As we see in the Jeep Cherokee or even the Range Rover Evoque, ninth gear really benefits high speed fuel economy. So if you're going over 75 or over 80 miles an hour, you will definitely get better fuel economy in the Renegade than in a lot of the competition, even though this has a very square profile because of that ninth gear. The other transmissions in this particular segment don't have final gears that are this high and they really help improve fuel economy. Pricing on the Renegade gets a little bit more complicated than the competition. The reason for that is there are more versions of the Renegade available than you find in any of the other subcompact crossovers. The base price for the Renegade is very low in the United States. It starts at $17,995 for the front wheel drive sport trim with the 1.4 liter turbocharged engine, manual transmission, no air conditioning. The feature set or in a way the lack of features in the sport trim are the reason for its low sticker price. Because if you take a look at most of the competition, automatic transmissions and air conditioning are standard for the vast majority of the competition. Even the competitors that have standard manual transmissions and they make the automatic transmission optional, the automatic transmission doesn't cost as much as the upgrade in the Jeep. To upgrade from the manual transmission to the auto, it costs $3,000. That's not just because of the transmission itself, but because you also have to go up to this larger engine and it bundles a number of features on the inside as well. The feature set or perhaps the lack of features really is the reason for the low sticker price in the Jeep Renegade. Because the Renegade may start $3,000 less than a variety of the competitors, but you get $3,000 less car for your money. If you want to add all wheel drive, you can do that to either the manual transmission model or the automatic transmission model, and it costs about $2,000 in every trim line. For most shoppers, the Latitude trim is going to be the realistic base model for the Renegade. It starts at $21,395. It gives you things like air conditioning, map pockets on the backs of the seats, a leather wrapped steering wheel, six speakers, XM satellite radio, a touchscreen infotainment system like we've been seeing in this model, alloy wheels and auto headlamps. At $21,395, that is a relatively good value compared to the rest of the competition. However, you do need to keep in mind that the Latitude still starts with the 1.4 liter four cylinder engine and the manual transmission. If you want the automatic transmission, you do have to pay extra there as well. After the Latitude trim, we have some limited edition trims, which I'm really not gonna cover here because we don't know how long they're going to be on the market. Instead, let's cover the top two trims, which are unique to the Renegade and very different than the competition. We have the Trailhawk trim, which is $26,745. Obviously, four wheel drive or all wheel drive is standard. And then we have the limited trim, which falls on either side of the Trailhawk in base price. Limited front wheel drive is $25,120, and the limited with all wheel drive ends up being a little bit more expensive than the Trailhawk. 
You can think of the Limited trim and the Trailhawk trim as the two top end trims in the Renegade, because instead of luxury features like we're seeing in this Limited trim, the Trailhawk gives you all-wheel drive capability. It gives you that two-speed transfer case, the improved ride height. We actually go down in terms of the tire size because we want more cushioning for rock crawling. We have a rock crawl mode in the terrain management system as well. We also get hill descent control. The Trailhawk also gives you tow recovery hooks and a slightly different exterior that's a little bit more rugged themed. The off-road ability obviously separates the Renegade from the competition, but there are a few downsides you should be aware of. The increased curb weight that we get in this vehicle in order to make it off-road capable causes it to be slower and not handle as well as most of the competition. The limited all-wheel drive trim that we've been driving this week has a 9-speed automatic transmission and one of the more powerful engines, but it is still one of the slowest entries that we have tested in this segment. Obviously, it scores top marks when it comes to off-road ability, but it also scores top marks when it comes to ride and comfort on the inside. When it comes to comparisons, it's important to keep in mind that the base version of the Renegade is lacking a lot of those features we mentioned earlier. So although the Renegade is $3,000 less expensive than a base Honda HRV, you have about $3,000 less stuff in the vehicle than you find over there in the Honda. In fact, depending on how you equip your Honda HRV, it may be up to $1,000 less expensive than a comparable Jeep Renegade. Now, the Jeep Renegade is going to offer you features that you can't find in the HRV. It obviously is more off road capable than the HRV. It actually is a little bit faster than the HRV as well. Real world freeway acceleration in the HRV, especially, is glacial for this segment. And the Renegade, even though it is not one of the faster entries, feels a little bit peppier in that situation thanks to its nine speed automatic transmission. Mazda's CX-3 is one of my favorite subcompact crossovers right now. It's well priced, it's about $1,000 less than a comparable base model of the Renegade with the automatic transmission, even though we get more features in that CX-3. I do like the way the interior is put together as well. I think it actually has a more premium look, although not necessarily a more premium feel than the Renegade, and the exterior is easily one of the most attractive entries in this particular segment. On the downside, the CX-3 is not terribly off-road capable. It's also not terribly swift on the road. It handles very well, it feels very good out on the road, but it's not terribly quick. Also on the downside, rear passenger headroom is definitely limited because of the form and the cargo area is about half the size that we see in the Renegade. The Renegade, again, is not one of the larger entries in this segment in terms of cargo room, but it is still about double what we see in the CX-3. The CX-3 is fun to drive and it's attractive, it's just not as practical as the other entries in the segment. Nissan's Duke is sort of similar. Its styling is not as universally attractive as the CX-3. I actually find the Renegade quite a bit more attractive than the current generation Nissan Juke, although I do understand that's a very personal decision. The Nissan Juke's looks may be a little bit polarizing to say the least, but it is one of the best handling and one of the best performing vehicles in this segment. On the downside, its interior is getting a little bit old, especially compared to newer entries like this Jeep Renegade. The interior definitely feels a little bit cheap, and the cargo area, like we saw in the CX-3, is quite a bit smaller. So definitely some compromises. The Renegade is going to be much more capable on a variety of different surfaces, from gravel like we're on right here, to snow, ice, sleet, off-roading, mud situations, that sort of thing. This is going to be the much more capable vehicle compared to that Nissan Juke. The Chevrolet Trax is one of my least favorite vehicles in this segment. It starts at $20,300, so it is still a little bit less expensive than this when equipped with the automatic transmission. However, the Trax's interior is just not as attractive as the Renegade. It doesn't feel as premium either. The Trax is also one of the slowest entries in this segment, but I think the biggest problem for the Trax is that its very closely related cousin from Buick exists. The Buick Encore is not that much more expensive than a base Chevy Trax. It's between three and $4,000 more than the average entry in this segment, but you get more standard equipment and you get a longer warranty. Now the Encore is being completely redesigned for the 2017 model year, and I think that will take it definitely a notch above this particular interior. The price tag is not expected to change too far either. The Encore is not going to be one of the swifter entries in this segment. It is still going to be one of the slower entries. However, it does handle very well. It has a very practical cargo area and a very practical back seat. At $21,595, the Subaru Crosstrek has one of the highest starting prices in this segment. However, the Crosstrek and the Renegade really aren't the same kind of thing because this is a boxy crossover type vehicle and the Subaru Crosstrek really is just a jacked up hatchback. 
Subaru does not offer a two-speed transfer case, and you won't find a manually locking center coupling anymore over there on the Subarus. That means that when it comes to off-road ability, the Renegade is definitely a step above what we see in the Subaru. Now, the Subaru is quite a good deal, however. The Subaru at $21,595 comes with more standard feature content than we find in the Renegade at a similar price. My bottom line with the Renegade is that if you're shopping for the sharpest handling vehicle or the fastest vehicle in the segment, don't put the Renegade on your shopping list. That's not really where it's at. If you're looking for the most luxurious entry in this segment, you should put the limited trim on your shopping list, but one notch below the Buick Encore. If you're looking for the best in off-road ability, look no further than the Jeep Renegade. I suspect the Renegade will also excel in snow traction because if you equip this vehicle with dedicated winter tires, that locking center coupling really will help you get out of sticky situations that some of the other vehicles in this segment simply can't. Thanks for taking the time to check out this video. Again, I'm Alex Dykes. Be sure and check out those related videos on the side of your screen. Hit that subscribe button down there, and I'll see you next week.